What a wild NFC divisional game. Rams, Bucks. How did that all play out? Did they withstand Tom Brady and company? Find out in the next edition of Sideline Sports Podcast. Welcome to Sideline Sports Podcast. If you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. Episode number 99 just hits a little differently. One away from 100. But just because it's not 100, it doesn't mean the guest that we have today isn't a big deal, which he is. But first, I am Alex Nevecha from Sideline Sports Podcast, where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast. Of course, of your SoCal sports news. Now, I'll talk about that guy on my left-hand side, Jake Ellenbogen from downtown Rams. You guys bet Jake himself. How's it going, man? Pleasure to see you on the podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, you know inviting me. Really do appreciate it. And I'm excited to talk some ball, man, because there was a lot of good football. Um, you know, more of my flavor on Sunday. You know, I think we talked a little bit off air. I I like more of the, uh, you know, throwing down the field, high octane passing attack type style, uh, you know, football game. I'll take a Rams win, however they get it. But, uh, you know, if I had my preference, I definitely like that type of style that we saw, you know, between those two games, whether it be the, the Rams Buccaneers, maybe not so close in that one. Um, but, you know, with the, the, the Bills and Chiefs, I had no dog in the fight. So that was fun for me. I think you and I also talked about it that we prefer Sunday's games as opposed to Saturday's. No disrespect to those because all weekend long, just great quality football. And absolutely super exciting, super exciting. And let's kick it away with Rams, Bucks, first half, easily, all the way. Rams in complete control, offensively defensively in complete control. And that was always a big question mark with Matthew Stafford. Who are we going to see? We saw a great Matthew Stafford against the Cardinals. What's he going to be like here in TB against TB 12? So you see a Matthew Stafford full of composure and he is just on his game offensively. Yeah, you know, Matthew Stafford is actually four and two, well, now five and two all time against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, felt good coming into this game. Uh, felt like, you know, Stafford is one of those players that he has his moments during, you know, seasons where he'll get into a little bit of a slump, uh, you know, mainly because he's had to do too much in his career. He's not used to throwing the ball away. He's not used to being able to withstand throwing the ball away on a third and 20 or whatever, um, because he's used to that really being all she wrote. You know, when you're talking about situations that he was in in Detroit, you throw the ball away on third and long, you punt the ball, it's likely the end of the game. The Rams just have so many weapons and they have a defense that is just, you know, clicking at the right time. Uh, So he doesn't have to do that. So he's learning to really play to the strengths of the Rams and learning to kind of get away from the things that he, you know, used to do, his habits. And this is somebody that had one of the fewest, uh, you know, numbers and throwaways this season. Well, you did see him throw the ball away a little bit against Tampa. However, he was so good in Tampa. He was really good against Arizona. The big knock, you know, against Arizona that everybody in the mainstream was saying is that he didn't throw the ball a lot. So now all of a sudden, you know, uh, Sean McVay doesn't have the trust that he had once in Stafford. That was so far from the truth, and the Tampa game proves it. Um, You know, you like to see when guys learn from their mistakes. Stafford's learned from his mistakes at times this season. On top of it, McVay did. Um, look, they were not going to win this game if they took this to overtime. I'm sorry. I, I don't know, uh, you know the true outcome, but you're most likely to lose the game if you go to overtime on the road against Tom Brady uh, in the playoffs, no less. So they took you know, the right approach, and they learned from their mistakes. You know, McVay went for it, uh, you know, actually went to try to win the game, tied 27-all. Uh, you know, and he did not have a lot of time under a minute to go. Um, you look at the 49ers game, there's plenty of time and they ran the ball three times and punted it right back to the Niners. 
they had about a four percent, a point four percent chance of winning that game after Von Miller uh, sacked Jimmy Garoppolo, and the Rams only shed about twelve seconds off the clock since then. And it gave the Niners an opportunity to go down the field, tie the game, go to overtime, and win it. So the Rams knew, and Sean McVay knew that he had learned his lesson. They weren't going to do that again. And so to see that they had the trust in Stafford to throw down the field uh, to Cooper Cup on that first play after the weird kind of QB sneak that went wrong, Cooper Cup, they get to the 44, and then Stafford throws this thing, you know, 50 yards. People are going to say it's underthrown. It does not matter. Uh, in the face of pressure, and Dominic and Sue is about you know, a little bit more than a hair length away uh, from hitting Stafford and potentially winning the game if that ball comes out. Um, but what Stafford was able to do was hang in there, uh, you know, stare down the barrel of the proverbial shotgun and throw an absolute dart uh, to, you know, Cooper Cup to basically silence every hater out there. I mean, they're still going to exist and they got to win uh, this Sunday against the 49ers. But it was just an incredible performance from Stafford. Uh, McVay called a great game plan and the Rams, despite collapsing in a sense, uh, they were able to get out of the house and win that game uh, without it collapsing on them. How about that going two and O oh against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? You just mentioned earlier Stafford being five and two in his career against the Buccaneers, but this is not your traditional Buccaneers. You have the man, the myth, the legend himself, TB12, as the quarterback, the clutchest quarterback to play, to step foot on a football stadium, if you ask me, and to stop him. And to now, he is not questioning what he's going to do in his career. So for Stafford to do that, that is such a big deal. But unfortunately, Jake, the game was not all that pretty, especially when you want to talk about that fourth quarter. There were some hiccups in the third, but more in the fourth. Four turnovers? Just not the business. You can't do that against Tom Brady. You just cannot fumble the ball twice if you're Akers. Fumble the ball once if you're Cooper Cup, which he made, made up for it later on in the game. And a miscommunication, a snap sailing over the head of Matthew Stafford, unacceptable. You cannot do that in the postseason. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think the Rams, this kind of goes to show you, the Rams didn't win these games in 2019, 2020, 2018, 2017. Sean McVay had a hard time, real hard time coming back and winning games. The recipe for the Rams' success has always been leading in halftime. And up until week 18 against the Niners, their miraculous comeback, the Rams were undefeated under Sean McVay when leading at halftime. That changed, and really – Sean McVay didn't change anything moving forward. He just basically learned from his mistake. The big, you know, issue is when Sean McVay and that Rams team holds themselves back. No one can beat the Rams when they play their style of football, but you can, anybody can beat the Rams when you get them to play a different style or you get them to turn the ball over. And the crazy thing is, despite Stafford's three uh, turnovers earlier, you know, down this, this late game stretch, they were still able to overcome that and win. They were able to win in Baltimore. They won in Minnesota. You know, they beat Seattle. They beat Arizona. They have won these close games. And I said right around the time, after the, um, right after the Packers game, I said winning these games close against teams that are desperate to make the playoffs, it's playoff conditioning. It's getting you ready for the moments that literally are all or nothing. If you lose that Ravens game, who knows what happens? You know, I think everything has kind of come into play. I mean, the Rams, they went up against a team that had never won five straight before in the, in the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers had played against the Eagles, the Jets, the Carolina Panthers. They got shut out by the Saints without a quarterback. I mean, you know, the Buccaneers had proven the whole year they were not able to win five straight. And in this game, they had to win five straight. They couldn't do it. The Rams, they've won more than five games. But they have not won nine straight, which is what they would have had to do if they beat the 49ers. They would have had to win nine straight to win a Super Bowl. I feel like the loss happened in a good spot. It's the last loss of the season. You learn a ton in your losses and way more in your wins, way more than your wins. And so I think, you know, the Rams have really rallied behind that, albeit they've only played two games. But you go up against Arizona and Tampa, that is not a walk in the park, you know. Just because they destroyed Kyler Murray doesn't mean that Kyler Murray and the Cardinals aren't still here 
you know, if they draw the Cowboys, for instance, who knows what happens? We really don't know. Uh, that Cardinals team showed you at points in the season that they're really good. But, you know, the last two games against the Rams, I mean, they, they really exposed them. So, you know, I just think that's really what it comes down to is that the Rams have really done a nice job with the path that they've been given. Um, you know, they're winners of, what, seven of the last eight. I mean, they're really on the right track. And that I think that game, losing that game to the Niners, it's because the Niners were playing to get into the playoffs. They had more on the line. They had more to lose. They literally had everything to lose, um, you know, and everything to gain type deal. Whereas the Rams, they were playing for seeding. And it's not to say that they threw it away, but you could tell at the end of the game when people say they wanted it more. And it sounds count, you know, it sounds kind of like a casual thing to say, like, oh, they wanted it more. That's stupid. I'm not going to lie. I think it actually holds true here. The Niners just came out with another level of fire in the second half after dominating, uh, you know, the Rams dominated them the first. And so I think they did that same thing against Tampa, but the only difference is it took some incredibly ridiculous, I mean, things that never happened. You don't turn the ball over four times in a game. That just doesn't happen very often. And you, you, don't, you don't like fumble the ball four times in a game. That doesn't happen very often, but you don't have games where you fumble four times and you'll pick up any of them. You know, the, the math would show they would have gotten at least one of those. It was a wacky day at the office, but the Rams held in. They won the game. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. It's all that, that's ever mattered for Tom Brady. You know, when people make the arguments for him being the GOAT, they never talk about the fact he threw three picks in the NFC title game against the Packers. They don't talk about the fact that 28 to three, uh, you know, th- you know, come back against the Falcons in the Super Bowl. A lot of that was because Brady put them in that hole, throwing pick sixes and, you know, just being careless with the football. It really is a business about whether you win or lose. It does not matter about, you know, style points. And so we can look at the chiefs this weekend. And if the chiefs destroy the Bengals, and the Bengals have already won, honestly. But, you know, if the, if the Chiefs come out and they win 42 to 10 and the Rams beat the Niners 17 to 16, it will not change my mind on who's going to win the Super Bowl. I know it'll change a lot of people's mind, but style points don't matter because you don't start the next game with the excess points you had when you won. And so I think really it's all about survive and advance. And that's why, you know, I look at this, you know, this Bucks game and I'm like, As great as it would have been to blow this team out, it's almost better, once again, playoff conditioning to remind you, hey, you got high and mighty. You had a chance to really put this game away. You're up 27-3. to There's no excuse. It should have absolutely been a drubbing. But because it was close, I think it's going to work out well for the Rams. They're going to be ready, and this is not a team that was ever looking past the 49ers. But now they're one win away from the Super Bowl, and the Niners have to come back to SoFi and They've won six straight. That's sure going to be on their mind, but this team literally needed all the breaks to win that game. Like I said, 0.4% chance of winning with under two minutes to go. Rams did everything they could to lose that game. I think the Rams are a different team right now. We're, I think we're going to see that this weekend. And the Rams being put in a pressurized situation in that game. They were just sitting way too comfortable against Arizona, against Tampa Bay until that second half. Tom Brady was trying to be Tom Brady to come back into it, but the old man just did not have enough young bones in him to be able to come back into that game. But we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, Jake's already getting ahead of the game with talking about that Niners Rams game rematch of the NFC West, baby. It's coming up, folks, and the second half edition of Sideline Sports Podcast. This is George Sayers here on the Black Baseball Talk podcast host and CSUSM Baseball Club president, and you're listening to Sideline Sports Podcast. Second half action of Sideline Sports Podcast. Coming right at you guys. I am Alex Nebeka, the host of Sideline Sports Podcast, where if you're not on the sideline, it's not Sideline Sports Podcast, the source of your SoCal sports news. And first half, Jake and I talking all about what went well for the Rams, what they didn't do so well against the Bucks, and how old man TV12 is sitting on his couch right now, anticipating his life right now. And as he said in a quote, Whatever my family wants is what we're going to do. So I guess his wife wants to play football too. She may be want to be. She may want to pick up the football herself and play 
too. You never know. We may see some other Brady's. But second half action. Let's talk about it. Rams, Niners. This is not new, folks. This is not a new matchup. This is a rematch throughout the year. And it's been Niners that have had the Rams number throughout the whole entire year. And I'm going to put Jake on the hot spot right now. Do the Rams reverse the score in the big stage? Rams are going to win this game. Uh, you know, before the season started, I said they were going to win the Super Bowl. You know, this is, this is the best team in football. It's just a matter, you know, are they going to be able to play their style of football? I think they will. They're back at SoFi. I don't care if this uh, stadium is dominated by 49ers fans or Rams fans. It does not matter. The Rams won. They won eight out of ten road games, you know. So they know what it's like to go on a silent count. It's not unheard of. They would prefer to have more Rams fans, don't get me wrong, but they're ready for anything. This is a team that's chomping at the bit. You know, this is, this is the team that Niners fans and Niners probably thought that, hey, we're probably going to get the Rams in the playoffs, and if we do, we're going to win that game. And I understand, you know, winning six straight, obviously that'll give you something there, but let me just say this. The six straight does not matter when you get to this level. You're talking about Matthew Stafford, who has the best – second half passer rating in the league. You're talking about Matthew Stafford, who just led that comeback against everyone's self Brooklyn goat. You're talking about Matthew Stafford, somebody that has the most fourth quarter come from behind victory since the end of the league in, 20, in, in 2009. Um, you know, here's the thing. The Rams, if they were to go up 27 to three and say they just collapse, right? And, and they do the same thing that they did against Tampa. Garoppolo doesn't have what it takes to do what Brady did. And it's not even that Tom Brady was all that great. He had that one great throw to Mike Evans. But my point is that you don't have to worry about him going deep down the field. You don't have to worry about him picking you apart. You know, the way Von Miller's playing right now is arguably better than Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald's opening it up because here's the thing. This is what no one's talking about. Von Miller, you think about it, didn't play a ton. Okay. So he didn't play a ton this year. He's with the Broncos. He's getting double teamed. Then he gets traded. He is hurt. So he starts off, I think he missed two, three games, you know, with the Rams. So think about all that time that it took him a little bit to get acclimated. But on top of it, all the tread that he no longer has, the wear and tear that he would have this late in the season, he doesn't have. Because when he came back to the Rams, he's not getting double teamed like Aaron Donald is. Aaron Donald is still going to get double teamed and triple teamed and get the brunt of the attention. And that takes up a lot. That's a lot of wear and tear. Him and Donald both had the most uh, pressures on the quarterback this past week in the divisional round. Those two had the most in the entire playoffs in the, in the second round of the playoffs. They are going to be coming after Jimmy Garoppolo like a bat out of hell. And what I'll tell you right now, Garoppolo, I counted, he threw eight interceptable passes against the Packers. If it weren't for that condition, those lollipop throws to the flat are getting picked off every which way. He was way too careless with the football, and he got away with it because the special teams somehow put together, uh, you know, they took three points off the board for the Packers. They, they stopped that with, you know, a blocked field goal, and they actually put together seven points with a blocked punt to tie the game late. This is the thing. If you are sitting at home saying 27 to three, Jake, if they collapse, they still have Samuel. They still have that run game. This is where I stop you. I understand. And I respect Eli Mitchell. I think Debo Samuel's the scariest player in, in the playoffs right now. I think Cooper cup is the best, but when you're talking about a guy that can take one cut, one missed tackle to the house, you know, that you're talking about Debo Samuel, you know, running back wide receiver, He's special, but one, he's dinged up. The last play of that game before they kicked the field goal on third and seven, yes, he got the first down, but he left that game early, and that first down, he was limping on one foot. He, he was hopping on one foot off to the side. He's not guaranteed to be 100% healthy. Trent Williams isn't guaranteed to be 100% healthy, who is their bookend left tackle. One of the, hey, he is the best in the league at left tackle. Um, and here's the biggest thing to just assume that they're going to run it down the Rams throat. They didn't, they did it the first game. Okay. 
The Rams made adjustments. That second game, they had to do all sorts of crap to get back into it, and the Rams really did a nice job against the run. They gave up a few plays, but they really, you know, they, they made some adjustments. Now for round three, there's a chance that they have Sebastian Joseph Day and Ernest Jones back. And if that's the case, that run defense is going to be really short up. Ernest Jones is a great tackler, but furthermore, Sebastian Joseph Day is one of the best interior defensive line in all of football as far as stopping the run. This is somebody that was leading the league in win rate in those run blocking scenarios. He was shedding those blocks. He was gap filling, gap plugging, gap eating, whatever you want to call it. And they did not have him the last time they played the 49ers. So yes, you can tell me the 49ers can run the ball. They did against the Packers, but that Packers defense only gave up 13 and they didn't even give up all the 13. The Packers gave up 13. That defense didn't give up a a touchdown. You know, I'm not looking at this offense and saying, this is how they will beat the Rams. If the Rams don't turn the ball over, the 49ers don't have a chance in hell of winning. The 49ers have to make this game ugly. They have to do what the Tennessee Titans did. We at home were wondering how the hell the Tennessee Titans got the number one seed. Don't worry. You know, we're all thinking it, you know, no one wants to say it. We're all thinking it. How did the Titans get the number one seed? It's not like the Packers. The Packers at no point during the season looked like the old Packers. Rodgers took a lesser role. He had the best season of any quarterback, arguably, but he took a lesser role. They were running more of a balanced offense. Uh, you know, they were running downhill with A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones. They, they turned more into a balanced offense, right? The Titans just make everything ugly. They had a pedestrian of a, of a quarterback this year in Ryan Tannehill. He just did not look very good. The offense was just sputtering. They missed Eric Henry, but even when they had him, I just wasn't overly impressed with the offense at any point this year without Arthur Smith, who became the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. You look at their defense, though, making those gritty plays. You know, the turnovers. They have a guy like by the name of Janoris Jenkins. Rams fans know very well. He was with them in St. Louis. He can jump routes. He's a guy that can make plays. Kevin Byard. You had those guys that were making those plays. It's the same thing with the Niners. You look at the uh, Rams-Titans game, Danico Autry and Jeffrey Simmons destroyed the interior, got pressure right up in Stafford's face, and a quarterback just does not want interior pressure. Stafford can sidestep and go into the pocket when he has pressure coming from his blind side and from his right but he cannot step up in and go through interior pressure. So because of that, the Niners do pose a threat. DJ Jones is playing well. They have Arik Armstead. And of course you have Nick Bose on the outside as well. You know, Sam Bukam even had a sack last week. Like he's playing solid. Then you have, you know, Fred Warner. You have Aziz al Shair. You have Dre Greenlaw who's back. We saw what he can do. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pieces here. And the bottom line is the 49ers, yes, they'll have to make plays on offense. Debo's electric when healthy. I don't know if he's going to be healthy. I do know Jawan Jennings was just as dangerous in that game because he broke a tackle. Nick Scott could not tackle in that game. And he broke a tackle and set them up for that field goal to take the lead in overtime. You know, Brandon Ayuk came alive. They shut down George Kittle. Maybe you let George Kittle get a little bit more open to put in a heavy emphasis on stopping Debo Samuel. Maybe you, you kind of just give him his yards, kind of like what they did in the Super Bowl against, you know, uh, Julian Edelman, the Patriots. You give him his yards, but, uh, you know, you keep everything else, you know, intact. And so my thing is here is that as long as the Rams don't let Debo Samuel destroy them, you know, or George Kittle or any of those guys destroy them, if they let them have solid games – Like, Mike Evans had a solid game. You know, Gronkowski had a solid game. Aside from that 50-yard touchdown to Mike Evans, it was a pretty solid day, not a blow, you know, by me type day, not a huge day at the office. Pretty solid. Gronkowski had that one big, uh, you know, reception. Pretty solid day. Fournette had two touchdowns, but aside from that, he didn't run very well, you know. So, again, I'll give him a solid day there. But as long as you don't have anybody tear you apart, really this offense doesn't scare me. It's the defense. It's, you know, if you give pressure on Stafford up the middle, it's going to limit what Stafford can do. If you give him time to throw, they're not stopping him. You know, and that's the thing. If you're going to blitz Stafford, he's going to throw over your head and win the football game. That's what happened. The Bucs know it. He's the best against the blitz this year. It's not even close. So the 49ers, 
if they want to win this football game, they're going to have to make sure to do what they did. They're going to have to get pressure up the middle. They're going to have to stop the run, force the Rams to be one-dimensional. And not only that, try to force the Rams to be one-dimensional, but continue to run. Even though the pass is working, you want them to keep running the football. You want them to keep trying to establish the run with Cam Akers, Sony Michelle, Daryl Henderson could be back. Um, and they, they keep trying. It's like running into a brick wall because then they're wasting possessions. You know, I mean, Cam Akers ran 24 times for 48 yards last week because Vita Vea is a wall. You know, this, this is the thing. When they're doing that, they're just erasing downs. But the equalizer is a guy like Cooper Cup. Where on third and 20, Matthew Stafford throws a 70-yard touchdown at Cooper Cup. That's just ridiculous. The fact that they could just pull that out of the hat is just absolutely ridiculous. And they can do it at any point. So the Niners are going to have to be able to, you know, put that pressure up the middle, not allow Stafford to step into his throws. Because even when he can't step into his throws, he's dangerous, as we saw, uh, you know, in the game-winning, uh, you know, throw. Um, but I think they're going to have to get interior pressure. DJ Jones is going to have to continue to play well. Arik Armstead. Uh, Nick Bosa is going to have to continue to do what he's doing. And then, you know, on the, the offensive side, it's going to be very simple. Don't let Jimmy Garoppolo go down enough where he has to try to bring you back. Because at that point, you're in a huge hole. I mean, the thing is, the, the thing that killed the Rams is they played so conservative at the end of that game in week 18. I don't see them doing that this time out. And if they don't, then Garoppolo has to make throws that aren't there. He's going to have to make a play that's above the average. It's an above average quarterback play. I don't think he can make that. For that reason, I think the Rams win. I think, you know, Stafford is going to be able to do uh, whatever he needs to. He is on a mission right now. And if he throws an interception, won't be surprising. You know, I think this is somebody that, again, can make all the throws. He's very much like Favre. He is a gunslinger. Let's not forget about that. That is in his blood. So he could throw a pick. Teams and fans might be annoyed by it. But at the end of the day, this Rams team, they got Cam Akers back at the right time. I'm actually going to say the most underrated thing. You know, we talked about Sebastian Joseph Day already and Ernest Jones. But, you know, what if Daryl Henderson meant more to this offense than people are realizing? What if, you know, we're focusing so much on why did Sony Michelle not run the football but more about the fact that the Rams plan, keep in mind, before the season started, they were planning on a tandem between Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson. Daryl Henderson comes in after Cam Akers gets hurt. They trade for Sonny Michelle after Daryl Henderson hurts his hand. Henderson's back for week one. But, you know, I really do think that maybe those two work in tandem better than Sonny Michelle. And, you know, honestly, when you look at the statistics to prove it, I mean, Henderson's looked like the more – he's been the better back statistically, uh, you know, over the last two years, you know. And so that's, that's the thing is that, you know, Michelle obviously had that run where they changed the, the offensive line, they changed their blocking schemes, you know, they changed their personnel groupings, and they made those adjustments that honestly are the reason they won five straight after the Packers game. But at the same time, Henderson didn't run behind that. You look at the Arizona game – Henderson had 14 carries for 82 yards. Sony Michelle fumbles at the 20-yard line. Their own 20-yard line completely changed the course of that game. People will say, well, you know, Daryl Henderson didn't run for over 100 yards. I would argue he was easily going to go over 100 against the Texans, had 89 in that game. They took all the starters out at the end of the third. Um, you know, there's so many opportunities. The Giants game, showing you his ability on a wheel route, catching that touchdown back shoulder, uh, you know, towards the back pylon. Stafford puts it on him. Uh, over, you know, Tay Crowder and coverage with the Giants. You know, I just think it kind of goes to show you these guys really complement each other. And maybe, just maybe, Sony Michel uh, should be used as just another guy in that rotation. And we should focus more on how to balance everything out. You don't want too much power. You don't want too much speed. You want to be able to find that mix. I'm okay bringing in Sony Michel at the goal line. Cam Akers has shown that he's probably not the best at the goal line. Um, you know, you look at the stats there to prove it, uh, honestly, you know, from a, you know, all around standpoint, there's no denying Cam Akers passes the eye test. He looks the part. He is the part really when he's fully healthy, he is the number one back, but Daryl Henderson, I think can offer some things that maybe the 49ers aren't ready to prepare for. Um, and Sony Michelle can help them if they're at the goal line. So they don't have to put Stafford in harm's way to, 
you know, go with one of those QB sneaks. So I think with everything going on, the Rams have so many opportunities, so many weapons, so many fail safes, if you want to call them that, uh, to win this game. If things don't go this way, they have a way to win in this way. If you want a double cup, we've shown you that we'll go to Odell. We'll go to Van. We'll go to Cam. You know, I mean, Kendall Blanton is getting touchdown passes in the playoffs. I mean, this is the thing is that anyone, everyone and anyone can eat, you know, in the playoffs. And, you know, this is where it goes, you know, between Rodgers and Brady and Stafford. I'm sorry. I mean, Brady was not comfortable throwing to Tyler Johnson and he was not comfortable throwing to Scotty Miller over guys like Mike Evans and Gronkowski. Whereas you look at Matthew Stafford, he's fine throwing to Kendall Blanton when the game is on the line. He's fine throwing to whoever, you know, Aaron Rodgers didn't even want to throw to Alan Lazard. Um, Alan Lazard, you know, famously caught that touchdown to really put them, you know, in an earshot of winning the game uh, against the Rams when that game was actually pretty close last year in the divisional round with golf. But, you know, I watched Rodgers. There were times where he did not trust, you know, he trusted Adams. Adams wasn't open. He trusts Jones. Jones wasn't open. You know, when Dylan goes down, and he's looking, he sees Alan Lazard, he sees Equinemius St. Brown, uh, Jeremiah DeGuara. He didn't trust any of them. Whereas Stafford, I mean, I've been saying for a while, if anybody follows me, you know, on those fronts, Stafford, I highlighted a play against the Titans. They had to have it. It was a long play. And he throws 50, 60 yards down the field to checks notes, tight end four, uh, Hunter Bryant when he was on the Lions. So, you know, to me, I just feel like this is somebody that's willing to spread the ball out. Sean McVay is somebody that's shown he's willing to admit he's wrong, uh, fix his mistakes, make adjustments, get creative. They use that 15-yard, uh, um, you know, they started using that jet motion again. They did the end around uh, for Van Jefferson, get him some space, a 15-yard gain. I want to see more of that. I want to see more creativity. I want to see running backs out there together. I think having both Akers and Henderson out there could create some mismatches. This is it. You know, put it all on the line. I think the Rams will, and that's why I think they win. And I haven't win 27-17 uh, in this one. There you have it, folks. Complete breakdown of the NFC Championship game. It's Jake Ellenbogen from downtown Rams, bringing you guys all the coverage. I'll put his social media handles down in the description below. He's got the full coverage. You guys know it. Everything Rams, the guy knows it. I mean, crying out loud, look at his background right there with the Rams <laughs> hat and with the helmet back there. I mean, kind of hard to beat. But, Jake, pleasure to have you on, man. You knocked out every point, every question that I had. <laughs> you, you, I, I – I didn't have any other questions. You answered them all. And I think you answered everybody's questions out there as well. Well, I appreciate you having me, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, sorry. I mean, I do talk a lot, so, you know, there is that, but uh, no, it's a lot of fun. And it was the first time, you know, since I've actually made my preparations kind of gone through my head, how the game is going to go. It's my first time to really lay it all out. And, and I feel like um, hopefully I did that uh, well enough. <laughs> Uh, you knocked out every point. I think if anybody were to have a rebuttal or anything, I don't know. I don't think anybody can really say anything <laughs> after that. But I just have to say, it's not going to be an easy game for either team. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come up for the Rams to them come up with all the big plays, come up with something different. They've got all the weapons offensively, defensively, and expect the Rams to really try to go and throw everything at the Niners. But I am Alex Nebeka from Sideline Sports Podcast, the source of your SoCal sports news. Make sure to hit the subscribe button down below. Also, hit that thumbs up, hit the notification bell, because Jake is just the start of some of the big names that we have coming up. And Jake, he was guest number 99, episode number 99 of Sideline Sports Podcast. So, Who's coming up for episode 100? Jake, once again, just the start of it. Who's number 100? So we'll see you guys next week. Enjoy the AFC and NFC championship games. See you guys next week on another installment of Sideline Sports Podcast.